In 75 years, over 14,000 men have played in the National Football League. From small towns and amber waves of grain to cities, sea to sea, they have come to play America's game. Back to throw Montana. Steps up, throws. This is the story of a select group of those men who could seize a moment and make it theirs for all eternity. United gives to Amici. Let's hope for the world champion. Amici scores. Walter Payton becomes the National Football League all-time leading rusher. The greatest touchdown scorer in the entire history of professional football, Jerry Rice. These are the men whose passion for the game was exceeded only by their excellence in playing. Once I got on that football field, it was like a world of its own. I love football. I made up my mind that I was not taking any prisoners and the wounded would be shot. I never tried to analyze, well, how did I do that? I did it. In Texas here, we have a saying, it's not the size of the dog in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog. You play the Bears, and I've heard it myself from different people, is that they better get ready, you know, and that's all the respect that I need. If I was an animal jerk ass or whatever, I didn't care. The ultimate compliment is that your opponents respect you. Joe DeLamalure, when he was playing for the Browns, said everybody on this team hates Lambert's guts, but we all wish he was on our team. To me, that's what it's all about. You're carrying a lot of people. You're carrying the city. You're carrying your alma mater. You're carrying your mom and dad with you. You're carrying all the things that you've learned about sports. These are the players who chose roads not taken and traveled to a place above all men who have ever played pro football, the NFL's all-time team. Hi, I'm Steve Sable, and welcome to Volume 6 in our greatest ever series, the NFL Dream Team. And you know, this is a tape I've always wanted to be part of, the National Football League's all-time team. Now, NFL films, well, we've been doing highlight films for 30 years, but this one, this is the ultimate highlight, the game's greatest players in one show. This is truly a dream team come true made up of players from every generation, men who symbolize the true definition of greatness. All other players are measured against them. As you uh, go into the pros, what goals have you set for yourself? Well, number one, uh, I would like to be the all-time receiver. Uh, they have some great receivers here, and I'm trying to follow in their footsteps. Jerry Rice is the latest in a long line of great receivers, a list that begins with Don Hudson. There was a fellow in Green Bay that had a radio network. This was before television. And he used to come on about 12 o'clock, and we'd be in the locker room, and everybody would listen because he's critical of Lambeau to beat the band. And this time he spent his entire 30-minute program telling what a lousy deal he made in signing Don Hudson. We played the Bears. It was an opening game. They kicked off to us. We brought it out to the 20 and on the first play. I caught a pass for 80 yards for a touchdown, and as the game ended, 7 nothing. And that was the last we heard about this guy on the radio for a while. <laughs> Hudson enjoyed the last laugh, averaging a touchdown every five receptions. From 1935 to 1945, he scored 99 times. Proving he was no wasted draft pick may have motivated Hudson, but what drove the other receivers on the all-time team to excel? I hated to drop a football. It uh, was what really motivated me to find some way not to drop them. And so that led to developing a routine or a program in which every day, every week, I just uh, drilled and drilled and drilled on making the catches that I did not know when they were going to come up in a game. I just knew they were sometime or another. Raymond Berry's long hours of practice paid off. When he retired in 1967, his 631 receptions were an all-time record. 
If I dropped the ball in a ball game, I wanted to make darn sure I could look back and say there wasn't one other thing I could have done about it. <laughs> that made me feel a little better. My dad looked at me and he said, I think you played pretty good, didn't you? And he said, well, no matter how good you are, there's always going to be somebody who could do a little bit better. And I went through my whole career looking for somebody like that. Lance Allworth ran scared for 11 seasons, but his dad was wrong. There was no one better. Seven straight 1,000-yard seasons proved to Allworth he was the best. Now, he only had to convince his dad. I realized at that moment that all the things that I had done in professional football, I had been trying to prove to him that I was that good. Dad, your son just got voted. I couldn't get out. I couldn't finish it. Number 19 in his finest hour, Hall of Famer, Lance Allworth. Hey, Dad, I really am good. Allworth's poignant search for paternal approval ended in Canton, but another Chargers potential was clear from day one. The first thing Coach Curiel said to me wasn't, hello, how you doing? The first words out of his mouth were, how would you like to play wide receiver? Kellen Winslow wasn't a wide receiver, yet he played tight end like a wide receiver. His big frame and soft hands redefined the modern role of the tight end. He was in the right place at the right time. It was a system that was made for Kellen Winslow type player. Winslow exhausted himself to excel, a trait shared by another all-time teamer years before. In the 60s, the look of the tight end position had the steely glare of Mike Ditka. Although he could go deep, Ditka became known for his toughness. It took more than one defender to bring down Iron Mike. On this play in 1963, he broke six tackles. It was a concise resume of his career. It kind of went in cycles, you know. I started out in Chicago, and that was my life. And I went to Philadelphia, and that was almost my death. And then I was resurrected in Dallas. As a player, you know, it'll never show in the record book, but I probably played better in Dallas than I did Chicago because I was a team player. I really played hard for them. The greatest team player with the greatest determination is Jerry Rice. I think if you're going to be the best receiver to ever play the game, you're going to have to uh, be able to uh, take on the pressure of uh, making the big plays. You know, I like being aggressive. Whenever the ball is up in the air, I believe the ball belongs to me. And that's the attitude that you have to have. Jerry has the ability to turn a short pass into a long game very easily. He has great going from zero to full speed speed. You don't see him being caught from behind by guys who are faster than him, but yet he can get going from that catch and you know, almost stop to full speed as quick as anyone. So many receivers, once they catch the football and they just fall down, but with me, I feel uh, once I catch the football, that excitement is just starting. So somehow, uh, I'm going to try to keep my balance and, uh, and try to get into the end zone. Without a doubt, Hands down, Jerry Rice is the best receiver to play in the National Football League. And he is looking for Jerry, and Rice is there, and he's into the end zone! He's done it! Jerry Rice, in the 75-year history of the National Football League, is the touchdown scorer of the century. There's no one particular catch that describes Jerry Rice, whether it's a one-handed miracle, whether it's two hands over the top of the defender, where it's racing and streaking between defenders, Rice has done it every way, and he stands alone at the pinnacle of National Football League history, the greatest touchdown scorer in the entire history of professional football, Jerry Rice, number 127. I would like to be the all-time receiver, 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 receiver. While pass catchers were pushing the envelope of offensive football, men such as Dick Knight Train Lane were devising ways to seal it. Lane joined the NFL out of tiny Scotts Bluff, 
Junior College. He came from Texas and he spoke this very strange language that nobody could quite understand. If I'd catch me and my, when the Cleveland Browns, every time they come, they were just a class. They'd always had to strike that early. And I said, man. I'm not even sure that he understood a lot of what he was, he was saying. But Night Train Lane made his intentions crystal clear to his opponents. He was one of the few players that hurt you every time he tackled you, Butkus being the other one. Oh, he'd kill you. He'd kill you. He wouldn't tackle you necessarily fair. They made a head tackle on Outlaw because of Night Train Lane. Train would just reach and grab him by his neck and just pull him down, and that's called the Night Train Neck Tackle. Because if you don't hit him right, you break your elbow, your arm or something, you know. So you got to really get him right in front of you and hit him with that forearm and rip him up. When you're talking about Night Train Lane, you're talking about, in my book, the greatest defensive back that ever played the game. Dick Night Train Lane wrote the book that all future NFL defensive backs would have as required reading. Cardinal safety Larry Wilson digested Night Train's text, then added some new chapters. Wilson pioneered the safety blitz forever ensuring his place of infamy among NFL quarterbacks. He once played a football game with two broken hands. He intercepted two Pittsburgh passes. In 13 NFL seasons, Wilson picked off 52 passes, but number eight is proudest of his toughness as a tackler. I took pride in being a tackler, a hitter. I wanted people to know that if you got in my area, I was gonna hit you and I'm gonna hit you hard. Toughness was also part of safety Kenny Houston's game. Houston played 14 NFL seasons, the last eight with Washington, where he made a game-saving tackle against the Dallas Cowboys that's still part of Monday Night Football folklore. All-time team cornerback Michael Haynes also played 14 NFL seasons. His first seven were the New England Patriots, and his final seven were the Los Angeles Raiders. In Super Bowl 18, Haynes' man-to-man -man coverage threw a blanket over one of the most prolific pass offenses of all time and played a decisive role in a lopsided Raider victory. Finally, there are two thoroughly modern defensive backs on the all-time team who nonetheless exhibit timeless winning virtues. Ronnie Lott, and Pittsburgh's Rod Woodson. Back goes Wilson. Wilson fires under pressure. It is tipped into the air and pulled in by Pittsburgh. Rod Woodson with the ball going down the far side of the 40, the 30, the 20, the 10, the 5, and it is a touchdown on the return by Rod Woodson. Ronnie Lott's attitude still reflects the respect he has for a game he played so well and loved so much. I've been a part of this game ever since I was born, watching it. And I think the way that I have put it all in respect is that I appreciate it. I never abuse it. I enjoy it. I have a passion for it. And most of all, uh, it's been fun. The greatest accomplishment in the world is not by yourself, it's when you do something with other people. And uh, to me, that's something that I'll miss. What I've learned about the NFL is to try to approach it, especially at the end of your career, as if you were playing when you first started playing this game. To go out and play the game just like I played it when I was eight years old, to go out and have fun, to not walk away from the game bitter. In the twilight of his career, Ronnie Lott was what he's always been. A modern-day night train lane. 
a living legacy to NFL greatness and all who helped shape it. You're carrying a lot of people. You're carrying the city. You're carrying your alma mater. You're carrying your mom and dad with you. You're carrying all the things that you've learned about sports on the football field. And you have to know that for a couple hours, it's you against the world. In a world of relentless menace and obscurity, offensive linemen epitomize diligence without reward and success, without applause. If you don't win the game in the trenches, you're not going to win it. The offensive line is the basic heartbeat of the whole football team, and it has to function. If that heart is not beating properly, if it's not running in sync, you're not going to win football games. No football team goes anywhere without the big men up front. But while backs can follow their blocks to be successful, blockers themselves have only their own instincts to follow. And while tenacity is constant, technique is not. This is a fleeting type of thing. You know, you're only as good as your last play, your last performance, so you're always concentrating on carrying that over and you don't really uh, want to uh, do anything that might make it more difficult for yourself by patting yourself on the back and doing that type of thing. I was a big guy, but I was never one of these the guys that were 6'6", 290 and benched uh, you know, the whole weight room. I was never one of those guys, so I knew that I had to really depend on my foot technique, the foot quickness. I really had to work on positioning. You know, that was something we worked on over and over and over. I enjoyed the attack side of football. I didn't like to be a guy sat back on his heels and let the guy come and beat me up. I liked to go after them. It was, uh, it was purely offensive. Whatever the defensive player did, it was going to be wrong. Watch the stunts, watch the stunts. If he took an inside move, we'd take him to the inside. If he took an outside move, we'd knock him to the outside. If he stood there, we'd run right over. So he couldn't win. You okay, Pitts? Man down. Huh? Manage that carriage. You get out there on that little old sucker, he don't know what to do. Pitts, I hit him with a forearm while ago, so he's out. The game has changed considerably since center Mel Hine was the league MVP in 1938. He's the only offensive lineman to ever earn that distinction. Fifteen years later, Roosevelt Brown earned fame as the game's first pulling tackle. Forrest Gregg mastered the intricacies of both guard and tackle, personally escorting the Packers' vaunted running game to five NFL titles. If Gregg was versatile, Jim Parker was invaluable. As Johnny Unitas' personal bodyguard on the field, Parker first played left tackle, protecting Unitas' blind side. However, no one could turn a blind eye to Parker's immense talents. Eventually, Parker would play both guard and tackle. But he was always 275 pounds of pure purpose. Parker was probably the best blocking lineman in the history of pro football big and as fat as he was, he could still be where he had to be, and brother, he could tag. Parker was the first offensive lineman elected to the Hall of Fame. But individual honor is not what a lineman seeks. Once I got on that football field, it was like a world of its own. I love football. It's a tremendous honor to, to actually do what we did, and it's a tremendous honor uh, to just be a part of this unique, unique fraternity. There's no other fraternity in the world like the fraternity in the National Football League. God, I loved it. When I heard that Baltimore Colts song, and when I ran on that field, I felt I was in heaven. Luckiest guy in the world. On the defensive side of the pit, opposite the greatest blockers of all time were men such as Gino Marchetti. He's the only man that ever played that I couldn't block. I was thinking if the coach ever traded me and I had to play against him, I wanted to know how to block him because I knew he's so quick off the ball. He would beat the ball off the ball and they would never call him offside. I always try to compare myself like with Sugar Ray. I was more like a Sugar Ray. Punch, go in, go out. Um, and then bowl over a guy. I tried to mix it up as much as I could. 
to be chosen as one of the top defensive players in the last 75 years, it really surprised me, to be honest with you. Green Bay defensive end Reggie White is still writing the final chapters to his remarkable NFL story. The most sought after free agent in history is presently showing Packer fans what Philadelphia already knows. An ordained Baptist minister, White now champions the virtue of defense to the Packer faithful. Then practices what he preaches. When I was a freshman in high school, I was 6'5", but I only weighed about 150 pounds or 160 pounds. And I got knocked down time after time, but I, but I kept getting up. And I kept, you know, just kept getting up and kept trying to make a play. And pretty soon my sophomore year, I started making a lot of plays. In Texas here, we have a saying, it's not the size of the dog in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog. The cornerstone of Dallas's doomsday defense, Bob Lilly was a pit bull who fought his way to NFL greatness. I was able to take up a couple of guys, sometimes even three, and I did it consistently for several years. And I did have a little more freedom, and I had a, a responsibility inside, but I also had the opportunity, if that guard pulled, to make things happen. I could be back in that backfield and try to tear everything up, and that was my job. I was very quick, and I had good agility. And I had a knack of being able to get rid of that first guy real fast. I usually didn't worry about the first man very much, especially when it was a sure passing down and I set out to rush the passer. In Super Bowl VI, Doomsday destroyed the Miami Dolphins, an effort that featured the longest sack in Super Bowl history by a man who didn't know the meaning of quit. The highlight of my playing career was when we beat Miami. We had been called the bridesmaids of the NFL up until that time. And I think when we picked Coach Landry up and carried him off, and he had the big grin on his face. And I had a cigar somebody gave me, it was about this big, and I really didn't smoke at that time, but I put that cigar in my mouth and lit it up and blew smoke all over everybody. <laughs> the smoke Bob Lilly generated in the locker room was a pale reminder of the fire he left on the field. They were called the Fearsome Foursome, but in this Fab Four, most of the hits were recorded by the unequaled one-two punch of Merlin Olson and Deacon Jones. I would like to think that uh, during the 10 years that Deacon and I uh, lined up side by side, that we did set a standard that uh, would be hard to equal anywhere. The way we played the game was intimidating because we were always coming at you. We were very aggressive off the line of scrimmage. And in the process of doing that, we did put some pretty good hits on people. That is an understatement. But it would be hard to overestimate Merlin Olson's impact. His 14 consecutive Pro Bowl appearances is a record which still stands. Olson was intensity incarnate, but his quiet confidence was a luxury the loquacious Deacon Jones couldn't afford. Being a 14th round draft choice and a salary of $7,500, club ain't got very much invested in me. So the only chance that I have is to open my mouth. So I threatened people. I told them I was going to tear their heads off. And I went out there and practiced and I did that. The Deacon wasn't just quick with a quip, however. I had one thing going for me and that was speed and quickness. And I could outrun daylight. I want to hit you every down. I wanted you to understand that if you're holding me, that I'm gonna, I can make you stop by going upside your head. But I made up my mind that I was not taking any prisoners and the wounded would be shot. He neither sought nor extended pity. A barely controlled fury seemed to propel him. Watching number 75 was like listening to an infernal choir. Menace and anger swirled like brimstone. 
To Deacon Jones, mission and motivation were the same, search and destroy. You gave me $100 million, I'd have still hated quarterbacks the same as I always have. I'd have still try to tear the heart and soul out of, out of that quarterback and that offensive tackle if you'd have gave me $100 million. Because my thrill came from the fact that, that I could pit my skills against the best in the game. And I didn't come from the background where I was ever going to be thought of as the best in the game. I was going to have to prove it. So competition was what made me go. And the hate of quarterbacks. Deacon Jones not only coined the term sack, he perfected it. This man was a warrior. In 1969, the Pittsburgh Steelers' top draft choice was an obscure, small college defensive lineman named Joe Green. North Texas State University in Denton, Texas is where I played ball. And they call us the Mean Green Eagles. And when I went to, North, uh, went to uh, Pittsburgh, uh, my rookie year, I guess, uh, I went from Joe Who to Mean Joe in the span of maybe a month or so of the regular season. If I wasn't out of control, it would resemble being out of control. It was my desire to win. Of similar sentiments was a cornerback drafted in 1970 named Mel Blunt. In 71, Penn State's linebacker factory delivered Jack Ham to the black and gold. We started to gain, you know, confidence in one another and started not to be surprised when we experienced a little success. In 1974, the final stroke on this masterpiece arrived from Kent State University. My dream in life was to play professional football, and I was drafted as an outside linebacker for the Steelers. And I was about 6'4". I think I weighed in the, the training camp at about 203 pounds. So my goal was to play well on the special teams, try and make the team that way, and hopefully someday get a chance to play. Jack Lambert made the team, and the Steel Curtain became the decade's most dominant defense. They pounded the Oakland Raiders to win the 74 AFC Championship, then humbled the Minnesota Vikings in Super Bowl IX. When Pete Rosell gave that trophy to Mr. Vernie, I don't think there was a dry eye in the house. You know, we all just felt so, so good for him. Typical Art Rooney Sr., unassuming, just said thank you to Pete Rosell, and that was it, not knowing that we'd win three more Super Bowls, but uh, for me, to finally be world champion was the highlight of my pro career. No Steeler savored or sacrificed more for success than Joe Green, the leader of a defensive line that became an NFL legend. As Bradshaw is a key to the offense, uh, that was Joe Green on defense. Um, he was a great player and made a lot of sacks prior to 74. But we got a new defense. We came in with a stunt 4-3 where Joe gets turned towards the center. In fact, what it does is it, it takes away a lot of the blocking scheme, but it also makes that defense tackle. It's kind of like a pawn in the chess game. You know, he gets eliminated by getting double teamed or even triple teamed, but so that Lambert or Ham can make a play. I mean, a lot of times I made tackles clean. I didn't have anybody blocking me because of Joe Green. Among these men, mutual admiration extends in all directions. Mel Blunt, guy could run like a deer, and he was almost as big as I was playing a cornerback position. I think he was 6'4", and uh, he played about 205 or 28, something like that, which is what I played at. But uh, he was about 10 times faster than I was. Great player, and uh, one of the greatest physical specimens I've ever seen. I wouldn't be surprised if right now you could give him a couple of weeks to get in shape, but he could go out and probably play right now. And finally, there are the two young men who grew up listening to Steeler broadcasts on the radio. Jack Ham, uh, in my opinion, is the greatest outside linebacker that ever played the game. Tremendous technique. He did everything right. He played the run the way you were supposed to play it. He played the pass the way you were supposed to play it. Consummate. He's just the best that ever played the game. No question in my mind about it. Jack Lambert played hard and expected his teammates to play hard as well. In a couple of games where we weren't being aggressive, he had no problem talking to me or Joe Green or the defensive line or whatever. I mean, that's the way he was. and. Uh, 
And I think we all, we all respect him for that. Professional football is not a popularity contest. The ultimate compliment is that your opponents respect you. Joe DeLamalure, when he was playing for the Browns, said everybody on this team hates Lambert's guts, but we all wish he was on our team. To me, that's what it's all about. We just had players out there who were great individual players, but I think we all realized if you're going to be a championship football team, you're going to have to play well together. And we didn't have a weakness on that team. When you go to an all-star game or a Pro Bowl and you look in the defensive huddle and you see six or seven or eight black Steeler helmets in that huddle, that's pretty impressive. He was the 23rd player chosen in the 1973 NFL Draft, the first punter ever selected in the first round. And for 14 years, Ray Guy proved that the Raiders chose wisely. He was as precise a punter as he was powerful. But more than that, he was a superb athlete, able to transform potential catastrophes into championship coups. And in the process, became as synonymous with winning as the team he played for. The second man providing the one-two kick on special teams is Jan Stenerud who didn't have the luxury of playing for one team. Jan Stenerud rarely missed and never wavered. His three field goals in Super Bowl IV gave the Chiefs a lead they never relinquished. But with a sense of competition as keen as his accuracy, Stenerud was never satisfied. And as he continued to break record after record, only two honors remained. The first was to become the NFL's all-time career leader in field goals. The second was to become the first true kicker elected to the Hall of Fame. Stenerud not only achieved both, he accomplished a third by earning a special place in the game's history reserved for those who persevere and ultimately triumph. Stenerud's lengthy career might have been predicted, but Billy White Shoes Johnson harbored no such aspirations himself. I thought if given a true opportunity, a true chance, I could possibly play in the NFL, maybe at least a year, maybe two years, never in my wildest imagination would I think I would play 15 years or play in the league as long as I did. Johnson's sense of spontaneity made him a joy to watch. The pioneer of the end zone dance, Johnson had a sense of humor every bit the equal of his talent. At that time, I was about six foot and one weighing 195 pounds, built like a Greek uh, statue. <laughs> I wish. The only thing I had going for me was speed and maybe some quickness. I would say right here, you've got to go to Billy White shoes and let him do a little dance with the ball and try to go for the end zone. Yeah, I punted the ball. I received it, and I was just trying to get some good yards. And all of a sudden, a hole opened. I said, I may be able to take this thing all the way. And I didn't know what was going on, on the sideline after seeing the film. <laughs> I might have stopped and watched Bum, you know, get totally uh, animated. He was a giant, at least in terms of heart and style. With a quick swivel of his hips or a head and shoulder fake, Johnson could go from sitting duck to sitting pretty. I think that was probably my best ever. Getting the ball and having to reverse fill three or four times and then uh, well, going to the end zone. I, I, I know it was one of my best ones because I was too tired to do my dance afterwards. I mean, <laughs> It seemed a supernova of talent had been extinguished, exhausted, Johnson retired from the NFL after the 1980 season. But two years later, White Shoes returned to the NFL with a new team, but with the same smile and, more important, the same magic. And in 1985, he guaranteed himself a place on the all-time team by becoming the NFL's all-time leader in punt return yardage. Of all the Hall of Famers, this is the all-star team. I made the all-star team of all the Hall of Famers. Billy White Shoes Johnson. Six points and a smile waiting to happen. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it for the greatest eagle of them all, 
number 15, Steve Van Buren. Steve Van Buren isn't just the greatest eagle, but still the most beloved as well. But number 15 wasn't just a touchdown waiting to happen. He was a champion, waiting for his teammates to follow his lead. Van Buren willed himself to four rushing titles, but more important, he carried his teammates to back-to-back -to -back championships. And though it was nearly 40 years ago, Father Time can't diminish the memory of the 1948 championship game, where Mother Nature almost succeeded at something no defenses could, stopping Steve Van Buren. Van Buren almost missed it. Steve woke up and there was this blizzard, and he didn't think the game was gonna be played, so he was at home. They finally called Steve and say, where are you? He says, uh, you mean we're gonna play? I had to catch uh, three trolleys and walk about uh, six blocks to the stadium. Van Buren found running in the snow far easier than commuting in it. Plowing through the drifts and the Cardinals with equal ease, Van Buren scored the game's lone touchdown, a fitting end to the Eagles' first NFL title. A year later, Van Buren would again dominate the league and again bring the city of brotherly love a championship. And while Van Buren might have lost his step, he hasn't lost his love for his teammates or his sense of timing. I'll, I'll see you boys at the next reunion 30 years from now. <laughs> 1930 was the year Bronco Nagurski, number three, exploded into the NFL. At 6'2", 225 pounds, Nagurski was considered the perfect physical specimen and the consummate combination of power and speed. In fact, it wasn't until after World War II that Nagurski relinquished that distinction to Marion Motley, number 76. A charter member of the Cleveland Browns, Motley wasn't merely the first black star since the league's rag days. He was a threat to score every time he touched the ball. At 240 pounds, he was a force of nature who gave defenders the grim choice of being buried or blasted. Motley was the paradigm for the position until the late 1950s, when another runner made his bid to redefine the game. Coincidentally, he also played for Cleveland. And by the time he retired, he would rewrite the NFL record book and become a legend. His name was Jim Brown. If you ask me who is the greatest running back who's ever played the game, it's Jim Brown. I mean, without hesitation, it's Jim Brown. No one's ever done what he's done, the way that he did it. I don't know how many times I've watched him go into a pile and, and three or four or five people hit him and he comes out running full speed. He was a master of the game. He was a master of mind games. And that's one thing that just made him so great as a, as a running back because you never knew how to approach him to tackle him. It wasn't just his running style that proved elusive because at the age of 29, this eight-time rushing champion at the height of his powers mysteriously retired to pursue an acting career. If fans were flabbergasted, defenses had a slightly different reaction. We was all happy. And anybody who said they wasn't happy had to be on the Cleveland Browns team. But I think all the defensive personnel in the league was very, very delighted that he decided to go into the movie business. Because let me tell you, he was a problem. I mean, you know, but there may be other guys with more statistics and more stats. But for the fear and pressure that he placed on the defense on a consistent basis, and he had the ability to run over you, run around you, and run past you. And there again, the man played nine straight years and he ain't missed no games. So we were very delighted that he decided to go into the movies. I made a statement. I left the game at age 29 and I left as MVP of the league. I knew that would give me a point of reference for the rest of my life because no one could ever say how long I could have played or if I was still at the top of my game because the statement itself was there. The legacy of Jim Brown is a list of achievements so great that only because he did them do we believe they could be done.
For 13 years, a grueling off-season workout was both metaphor and medicine for a man of solitary pursuits and singleness of purpose. For this man was running not just against a hill, but against a mountain of history. The pinnacle he sought was Jim Brown's rushing record. The man was Walter Payton. And if the quest was monumental, Payton was magnificent. No runner has ever made more cuts, spins, and jukes for a meager two yards than Walter Payton. But Payton's determination was born of survival more than style. Sweetness played for some woeful bear teams. And while they were overmatched, Payton himself was overwhelming. You couldn't discourage him. Walter played on a lot of teams that didn't have anything. I mean, he never took the wind out of him. I mean, he, he rushed here against us for 275 yards one game. We still won the ball game, but he still was fighting at the end. He got 275 yards against us. All those mornings on the mount, taught Peyton that if he honed his body like a tool, he could use it as a weapon. It's when you got, got an opportunity to hit somebody and to really nail somebody. That was what the game was all about, and I just didn't want everybody else to have all that fun on defense, so I took a little bit of defense over to the offense. Instead of being hit, I kind of attacked people and I hit them. Whenever I uh, had breakaways, I'd probably have to hit about four or five people and drag two more until they fell off before I had a 40-yard run. Maybe, you know, as coaches say, if you're real, if you're real uh, loose and reckless, you don't get hurt. And if you go 100% all the time, you don't get hurt. Well, he went, you know, he went 1,000% all the time. And, and he risked his body. He threw himself in wild places just to make another inch. Inexorably, those inches accumulated. And as he soared over goal lines again and again, he was flying toward football immortality. Jim Brown's rushing record, once thought unassailable, was within his grasp. Walter needs two to break the record. High formation, quick pitch to Walter, looking for the record, cuts back, he's got it! He's out of it at 25 to the 26 yard line. Walter Payton becomes the National Football League all-time leading rusher, surpassing Jim Brown, and that's the equivalent to Hank Aaron breaking Babe Ruth's all-time home run record. Walter Payton left the game a legend. But four years before Sweetness arrived, the game said a bittersweet goodbye to another legendary bear, Gale Sayers. Give me 18 inches of daylight. That's all I need. Officially, Sayers is the all-time team's kick returner, and Sayers relished the role. Hey, on kickoff return, they say, Gale, you shouldn't run back kickoff returns. I love running back kickoff returns and punt returns because I could see the whole field. You know, there wasn't nobody going on clipping from the backside. I can see what they were doing, so I, I enjoy that aspect of the game. To me, the satisfaction was, what did I do the first 10 or the first 12 to get to the 90 or to get to the 45 or to the 55 yard run? Uh, run over somebody, fake somebody out, stiff on somebody, gave my shoulder, spun, now I'm off to the races. I never tried to analyze, well, how did I do that? I did it, you know, and so uh, I enjoyed seeing the films of my move because uh, I had some moves nobody else had. Sayer's career was tragically cut short by an injury but he became the youngest man ever elected to the Hall of Fame. But in Buffalo, another promising runner's career almost never got started. O.J. Simpson was billed as a game breaker, but until 1973, Simpson was going nowhere fast. But that year changed everything. Over and over again, O.J. made holes when there weren't any and created daylight out of tangled jerseys. It seemed every carry was an ode to the muse of runners. He instinctively made all the right moves, spiriting himself away from danger almost before it was there. 
evading and outrunning 11 angry men. Every hair breath escape left a wake of prone defenders and futile heaps marking the triumph of his passage. I had reached a level that I always felt that I was capable of, you know, not that I thought of 2,000 yards, but that I was the best. Adjectives and superlatives were strewn in Simpson's wake, like empty-handed tacklers. Yet in the final game of that magic season, O.J. still needed over 200 yards against the Jets to reach 2,000 yards. And now it's for the 2,000, boy. A snow-covered Shea Stadium was the setting for Simpson's showdown with history. O.J. running left. O.J. five four. When that game ended, I knew then that I was a part of, 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 of the game, you know, a part of football. No matter whatever happens, I was the first guy to ever go over 2,000 yards. During the 1960s, the Green Bay Packers won five NFL championships. Middle linebacker Ray Nitschke epitomized the Packers' spirit of achievement. You play with a, with a lot, of, lot of spirit and with a lot of determination, a lot of inspiration. And that's the way I play. And my desire to perform, my desire to make the play, my desire to play every down like it's the last down, I think that's what it's all about. And hopefully that was my leadership. You know, I was always into the game, and I studied the game very hard. There wasn't anything that came on the field that I wasn't prepared for. So uh, I was a student of the game, and a lot of people don't realize that. Of all the game's scholarly practitioners, none was more scientific in his approach to linebacking than Willie Lanier. I had an instinctive understanding of how to play that position. It was to a point that you could really play the game in your head before the game. You could play the game mentally, but all within the confine of the control of the angles because that was the thing that would make the difference. I really had a five-year plan to work toward unseating Buckus as the dominant middle linebacker from the all-pro kind of team standpoint. You didn't get that. Yeah, didn't. <laughs> Outside linebackers have a different perspective on things. Six foot seven inch Ted Hendricks began his career in Baltimore, blocking kicks and wrecking game plans, a scenario that continued next with the Packers and finally with the Raiders. In Super Bowl 15, he snuffed out a Philadelphia field goal. Year in, year out, there was just no escape from the rapacious reach of the stork. Lean, mean Ted Hendricks. No sweat. But no player in recent history had more impact on the game than outside linebacker Lawrence Taylor. He changed the way the game was played on offense. Hey, come on, baby. You can't pussyfoot up in there. You got to run it. You got to run it. He may have invented the one back offense. Joe Gibbs started using the one-back offense to deal with Lawrence Taylor. It used to be that you'd say, well, our back block's him, and we go ahead and throw the pass. If you get a back block in Lawrence Taylor, you lose. I brought something different to the table that uh, maybe hadn't been seen up until that point. A linebacker was just a linebacker. All he did was stop the run. He went back and defended against the pass. I made so many mistakes in the pass defense. I was supposed to be dropping on this play so I wouldn't drop out of the rush. And that was my answer to everything. If you don't know what you're doing, just rush the quarterback. Hell, see what happens.
when I go to tackle someone, um, anybody can just tackle and bring you down to the ground. Anybody can do that. I look for something extra. So what I try to do is bring the ball with us because it adds something to it. And now it's funny how around the league, everybody goes for the strip. And I like to think that they've been watching some of my highlight tapes. It seems every year some bright new college prospect is dubbed the next Lawrence Taylor. The fact is, we may never again see this man's equal. People call it determination, whatever it is, he just had it and he just would not give in. He was going to make it the way he wanted to make it. Lawrence Taylor, outside linebacker, quite truly one of a kind. Twist them down. Yes, it's Dick was an animal. I called him a maniac, stone maniac. I, I, I don't understand it. I don't understand why they say things like that. He was the greatest intimidator to ever played football. You had to overcome the mystique. It was almost like an odor. He exuded a kind of a presence. Roses are red and violets are blue. If you've got any sense, you'll keep butchers away from you. He was an animal, and every time he hit you, he tried to put you in the cemetery, not the hospital. You play the Bears, and I've heard it myself from different people, is that they better get ready, you know, and that's all the respect that I need. If I was an animal jerk, ass, or whatever, I didn't care. <laughs> I had the ability to change my personality in an eye wink. Well, look at that, his knee. It's gone, man. Look at it. Oh! Damn. Start laughing at somebody or whatever. Someone gets hurt and you start laughing. Oh, they're going to say, oh, he's mean. So, you know, I think it's funny sometimes. You know what, yeah. Do you remember anything? No. <laughs> what do you think of a guy that's supposed to be this animal and then he's laughing over there? What is with him? He is nuts. You know, and that's what I wanted to let him think I was nuts. He raised more hell in the field and got away with more stuff than any player I ever played against. Well, here goes the tingle off. It's illegal for a middle linebacker or a single caller to say hut. They can talk and call defensive signals and that. Right and left. Watch the screens now, Jimmy. Screens, dog. Dick didn't understand that rule, and uh, he's always saying hut, hut. Get <laughs> And the ref would warn him, and he said, that's my signal to my linebacker, which is bull. They don't have any signal like that. <laughs> 12 men also. Who's off? 12 on. We'll take it on the kickoff. You know, they might say, well, that's, that's a high school thing. Go, you know, and every, the offensive lineman's jumping offside. But that's five yards, and maybe that's a key five yards and stops a drive or whatever. Nice, sunshiny, bright day, and all of a sudden, I thought he had a downpour out there uh, in a nice, clear day, and I look up, and there's Butka spitting all over my hands. Maybe I was leaning over the ball after I called the... Uh, see, with Minnesota, I could... I'd always turn around real quick, because I could look right through their huddle, and I could see Joe Cap giving the call, you know, red, uh, 28 toss, on two! And I had the big tingle off come to the line, and I was right over the ball, so maybe some sweat dropped down there. We had a rookie center that was playing against him for the first time. And of course, you remember Buck just grunted a lot and growled a lot when he was back up the line. You know, grunting and groaning, that was all a ploy. And the first time he came off, his eyes were about like this. He, he couldn't believe what he was hearing from Buck. Come on, give me a break. He is calling me everything in the book. And I mean, this is on national TV. He's threatening to kill me. He's threatening to kill my children. He's threatening to kill my mother and father. He's threatening to kill everybody. Our memories are a little tainted over the years. Butkus makes 26 unassisted tackles, or assisted tackles, whatever you will. He calls two fumbles. He bit me on the neck, and he almost grabbed Taylor by the groin one time when he was down. And this is the first warning, the neck. 
<laughs> Unbelievable. Do I know about Butkus? He used to just destroy people on our Minnesota team. One of the guards went through leading the play, and Butkus just destroyed the guard, and he he took Osborne on in the play and hit him. And I said uh, to Ozzy, I said, what happened to the guard on that play? You're supposed to have a lead block. He said, I'm not sure. I think Butkus ate him. What he brought to the game was uh, the people being aware of uh, what toughness is all about. Because uh, of the way he looked, he just portrayed what people have as an image of a tough guy. I just, you know, I just like being on the field. I, I don't know. I don't know if I can really put it in words. I just, I, I loved all of it. I loved practice. I, I could not get enough. I played on all the special league teams, you know, all the way up to the end. You know, some people might say, well, it's, you know, it's a way to release your aggression and everything else. And I, I don't go along with that. It's, that's a shallow way of looking at it. There's a football, that, you know, it's blocking and tackling, and it's very simple. But yet, it's very complex, and, uh, and that's the part I liked about it, I think. Butkus is synonymous with football. It's synonymous with hitting, contact, aggressiveness. He's the best who ever played the position. In 1937, a football phenomenon arrived in the NFL. His name was Sammy Ball. And he not only brought a new dimension to the NFL, but a new attitude as well. When you're on the field, you've got to feel like you're the best son of a out there. That's what you're thinking. That you, nobody is damn better than I am. In his rookie season, Ball led the Redskins to an NFL title. Besides his passing records, Ball still holds the NFL mark for punting average. In fact, the only challenge to Ball's versatility was his popularity. He had a charisma to attract fans. I remember in Philadelphia that when we played, and Sammy Ball was playing in those days, when we played the Redskins, we turned down 15,000 people at the gate, couldn't get in. He was an attraction. As easily as slinging Sammy filled stadiums with fans, he filled opponents with despair. Six times he led the league in passing, a record which still stands. Ball was not only the game's first great passer, he forever changed the game. But if Sammy Ball was a one-man band, Otto Graham was a maestro conducting a symphony of football. Otto Graham was a good, sound football player, big, strong boy could throw the ball good. He suited the Browns just right, because the Browns liked to throw the long ball, and they had good pass receivers who could run. But it was Graham who made the Browns go. In 128 games with Graham at quarterback, Cleveland won 104. Victory was almost automatic. Graham was more than just an idol. He was an all-American boy and a Renaissance man whose family values made him an ideal role model. But it was his athletic skills which made him an ideal quarterback. I, I had the athletic ability, good peripheral vision, uh, which is important. Of course, when you're a quarterback and some great big guy who's 290 pounds, six foot, eight inches tall, it's bearing down, going to kill you. You want to be able to see him in the corner of your eye and get the hell out of there. <laughs> you know, because otherwise you're going to get killed. Graham's fearlessness in the face of contact brought about a revolution in football headgear. The face mask was invented by his coach, Paul Brown, who had good reason to protect his star. Otto was really uh, the greatest of all the players. No man ever took a team into the final game of the season as many times as he did. They call it the Super Bowl today. In those days, it was called the World Championship. In each of his 10 seasons, Graham guided the Browns to a league championship game, winning seven times, including the final bittersweet game of his career. We played for the world's championship, and uh, he really had a great day. It was a big score, and courtesy to honor him, they took him out. And these were rival fans, but they gave him a standing ovation. And uh, when he got to the sideline, he came over to me, and walked up and said, thanks, coach. 
And I said, thank you too, Otto. To play hard all the time is the sign of a professional. To make the plays when it matters most is the mark of a champion and the legacy of Otto Graham. Call it grace under pressure or simply a hero's instinct. Johnny Unitas had it, but almost never got the chance to prove it. John Unitas came from the Bloomfield Rams where he was making $3 a game and the right to take a cold shower when the game was over playing in a Pittsburgh semi-pro league. And one of the coaches or players on the team wrote a letter or postcard to the Colts and we Bank reacted. The Colts like to say they got Unitas for 80 cents, the price of a phone call from Baltimore to Pittsburgh. But while Unitas' contract was average, he was anything but. John came in and his first completed pass was to J.C. Caroline, the Chicago Bear defensive back. 56-yard touchdown. Baltimore tries to come back on a John Unitas pass, but out of nowhere speeds the Illinois flash, J.C. Caroline. It was a great tip-off on Unitas' greatest strength, and that was his mental toughness his competitiveness, his confidence. Because, you know, that could have rattled a lot of young quarterbacks. And he just went on about his business and ended up having a very good day that day and, you know, for the next 18 years, I think. <laughs> Unitas was blue-collar tough, with the exception of his golden right arm. I always said, in my estimation, he was the greatest quarterback of, of all time. And they didn't call him the golden arm for nothing. I think more than just his talent as a thrower was his field generalship. You don't get this no more because coaches control the game from the sideline. But this man was phenomenal. He was just born to call plays. I mean, he could diagram them on the ground out there in the huddle, man. Two plays. First play, split right. Pretty serious right. Second play, be a split right, pull back, draw. Both of them on the line. Ready? Hey! Unitas' NFL record of 47 consecutive games with a touchdown pass is unlikely to ever be broken. But even on a broken play, Unitas' poise was peerless. An important game uh, adds pressure. I don't think Unitas ever felt pressure. 75 seconds to play. Packers 10, Colts 6. He was probably the best two-minute drill man to ever come in this game. just had something that the uh, top quarterbacks have, ice water in his veins. It really spooked the defense. They, they, thought he was, they thought he was Houdini. No game epitomized Unitas' mystique like the 1958 championship game. With the score tied in overtime, Unitas combined confidence with precision to drive the Colts to glory. John took charge and said, we're going to take the ball and we're going to go right down and, and score this time. No question about it. And you could just feel the confidence in the team. There was one man that made the difference, and that was John Unitas. He was the difference in that football game. Yes, Raymond Berry caught a lot of passes. Yes, Alan Amici scored the winning touchdown. But I'm telling you, Unitas was the difference. Up over the ball, come the Baltimore Colts. Unitas calling out the signal. If Unitas scripted history with quiet determination, Joe Montana authored a storybook career where the chapters keep getting better. The first page was a championship game. We're going to call a bin pass halfback fan. Corner. He's going to break up and break into the corner. Okay. You got it? If you don't get what you want, you'll just throw it, simply throw the ball away. Okay. You know what I mean? Hold yeah. it, hold it, hold it. Not there. Away it goes. Everything hangs in the balance now. The season, the outcome of a Super Bowl berth hangs in the balance. He has the ball. Montana rolling out the right, looking toward the end zone, throwing under pressure, throws his pass. Caught by Clark. Clark got a touchdown. It's a touchdown for the 49 He's like Indiana Jones. Uh, he can go up against odds, and he just believes in himself. He believes that uh, nothing can stop him. And Montana will get one throw. There's two seconds. Here's Montana throwing for the end zone. Race late. He's got it. Touchdown, 49ers. 
They win it. Joe finds a way to come out on top. Last 200, Jeff Denver. Last 200, Jeff Strangler. Last 200, Every time that he has to deal with adversity, he slaps it off like John Wayne. Career-threatening injuries did not stop Montana. In fact, every return to the field seemed only to strengthen his determination. When he walks in the huddle or onto the field, he, it's, that, that's the guys in charge, you know. You, you look out there, who's running the show? Number 16's running it. Trips right, tight, Z motion left, T78, X hook. On two, ready? Where other quarterbacks see chaos and danger, Montana saw opportunity and victory. Here we go! More than his talent, Montana's ability to lead made him the quintessential big game quarterback. We've opened the door, we're gonna go through it next week, and we're gonna take Kick ass and take no prisoners the week after. Right. In four Super Bowls, Montana never lost, which explains why, even when things seemed hopeless, his teammates had heart. Because miracles are what Montana did best. Montana trying to drive him the length of the field here with the game in the balance. 16 to 13, the Bengals lead at the 10 yard line. 39 seconds remaining. Back to throw, Montana. Stepped up, throw. It's not the money, it's the love of that, of that game and that competition every Sunday or Monday, whatever you want to say. Every down's different, and um, I just love it. Just a few closing thoughts. Of the 48 players on the all-time team, only 14 did not play on a championship team. Scotts Bluff Junior College produced just as many players as Notre Dame, one each. And while Don Shula is the NFL's all-time winningest coach, not one of his Dolphins made the team. The franchise that has the most members, the Pittsburgh Steelers with six. But every member of this team, no matter where he played, has left us a lasting legacy. Each was a man for his time. Now they're together as a team for all time.